What up, 8Push people? Today we're going to take a look at period 5, key concept 5.1. And the key idea for this concept 5.1 is the idea of manifest destiny and the movement west will have a variety of economic, political, and social consequences. You know, in this period, you know, in the 1840s, all the way up until the 1870s, you have huge amount of Irish immigrants coming into the country. And they're leaving Ireland because of a potato crop failure and severe famine, especially in the 1840s. They're largely going to settle in cities like New York and Boston, and they're going to be working in unskilled laborer type jobs. And as a result of this, there's going to be a tremendous amount of competition with African Americans, which is going to lead to racial tensions in northern cities. Um, politically, the Irish are going to be very important because they are going to largely support the Democratic Party. Um, in fact, by the 1870s and 1880s, the political machine Tammany Hall in New York is going to be heavily influenced by Irish voters. The second biggest group of immigrants coming into this uh, into the United States during this time period are the Germans. And they're a very diverse group of people. Germany is not a unified nation yet um, by this time. Um, there's a mix of German immigrants coming in, a mix of religions, Protestants, Catholics, Jews. Um, they're coming from a variety of social classes, lower, middle income, and wealthy, different occupations. And unlike the Irish, the Germans are going to largely settle in the Old Northwest and in the frontier on homesteads. And they're going to develop these very tight-knit German communities. As a result of this change of who's coming to America, these Irish and German immigrants, you have a rise in nativist or anti-immigrant feelings. And there's a variety of reasons and motives. One, there's this feeling, especially the Irish, they're taking jobs from native-born white Americans because they're willing to work for such low wages. There's also this concern that they're going to somehow outvote or take over American politics as you see that being expressed in the political cartoon. There's this belief that they're going to ruin American Anglo-Saxon culture with their inferior racial makeup. And of course, especially for the Irish, there's a huge concern because many of them are Catholics and there's this fear that somehow they're going to ruin this idea of a Protestant white Anglo-Saxon America. There's going to be political groups that are going to form the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner, later on forming a political group called the Know Nothing Party. They're a group of American nativists, and they're going to advocate um, for restrictions on immigration throughout this period. And an important concept to keep in mind, though, is America was becoming more and more ethnically and racially diverse. New people are coming in to America. Another key concept to keep in mind is this enthusiasm for territorial expansion and this has been a reality of American history way before the 1840s but it increases and it's based upon economic national security interest and claims of US racial and cultural superiority and really the big belief in the 1840s is this idea of manifest destiny this idea that it was America's destiny to conquer and civilize the entire continent all the way to, to the Pacific Ocean um, this idea is heavily built upon a belief of white superiority that we are somehow going to civilize. You could see that in that painting called American Progress. A lot of examples of American expansion during this period, 1846, a treaty is signed by James K. Polk establishing U.S. occupation of Oregon country at the 49th parallel. During the election of 1844, there was these threats of 54-40 or fight, no fight needed, and Oregon would be under U.S. command. Texas is annexed in 1845 by John Tyler, just as Polk is getting elected. And of course, the big one is the Mexican-American War, which will end in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and Mexico is going to lose a huge chunk of its territory to the United States. Big idea that you also need to keep in mind is new territories were brought into the Union which forced the issue of slavery into the center of national politics. They've been trying to compromise and avoid it and inevitably this is going to lead to a rise in sectionalism which we're going to cover in the lecture on Key Concept 5.2. In fact, if you click that pony, you'll be transported to that lecture on sectionalism. 
Now, the other part of this kind of period is this idea of Western expansion. And you can see on this map that expansion is taking place over time in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and so on. We've already seen this. For example, the Mormons were seeking religious refuge um, from intolerance towards their faith. In 1847, they settled in uh, Utah Territory. In 1848, there's the California Gold Rush, which brings a ton of people into the area, um, and you get the uh, rise of calls for California to enter into the Union as a free state. And a big idea you need to keep in mind when studying this period is that new economic opportunities and religious refuge out in the West were a key factor in bringing people, um, not just white Americans, but African Americans, Asian immigrants from China, and all over the world. Another important idea is this idea of the federal government actively promoting economic development and the movement West. You know, there's this idea that a lot of people have that, you know, these cowboys got on these stagecoaches and head, head it West, this rugged individualism. And this is not entirely true. In fact, economic activities out in the West were largely driven by federal government policies. For example, in 1862, the Pacific Railroad Act was passed during the Civil War, which authorized the building of the Transcontinental Railroad along a northern route. And you can see those red lines are railroad construction in the period 1870 to 1890. So mass building of the railroad out into the West. And the federal government is going to provide money and land subsidies to the railroad companies to construct this development. And the Transcontinental Railroad is going to play an important role of linking California with the rest of the Union, therefore creating a national market. Another kind of key part of the economic development of the West is the mining booms that take place throughout the West. Uh, we already talked about in 1848 the California Gold Rush, which kind of brings San Francisco up in its population. But similarly, you also have the Comstock Lode in Nevada, which leads to the growth of cities such as Virginia City. But you could see whether it be Colorado or future territory of Idaho, mining booms are going to take place throughout this period, and it's going to bring people, once again, not only from the eastern part of the United States, but from other nations such as China and so forth. Another key part of the economic growth of the West is the movement of people to the Trans-Mississippi West to start farms. You know, when you say the Trans-Mississippi West, we're talking about west of the Mississippi all the way to the uh, West Coast. And a big part of this was also driven by the federal government. You can see the different crops and agricultural items being uh, developed in this region, but the Homestead Act plays a key role. Once again, passed during the Civil War in 1862, and it offers public land up to 160 acres to any person or family who farmed that land for five years. They could buy it for a very small fee. And you get a huge number of people moving west seeking this economic opportunity um, that was presented and encouraged by the federal government with the Homestead Act. Now inevitably, with this movement west, you're going to have a dramatic environmental impact. And dramatic environmental changes will take place as a result of western expansion. And the biggest example is the huge population decline of the buffalo. Um, it is killed for a number of reasons. One, to make way for the building of the railroad. The big large buffalo herds got in the way of the railroad uh, operation to undermine Native American resistance. If you kill an important part of the Native American society and culture, the buffalo, it's going to hurt the Native American's ability to resist white expansion. And of course, there's this huge demand for buffalo hide out in the eastern markets. And those two images, the one at the top, shows you that drastic decline, and the one at the bottom shows buffalo skulls um, having been slaughtered. Another key environmental change is the removal of grass to develop these homesteads on the Great Plains, that area in the light blue, will lead to soil erosion and the degradation of the land. So the land is going to be used up because it's going to be over uh, planted. 
And then finally, the biggest impact will take place on the lives of the Native Americans in the Trans-Mississippi West. And there's a whole bunch of different environments out in the West, and Native Americans have adapted to those environments over many, many years. And it is going to, unfortunately, to brutal conflict between American settlers and the Native people who had... Uh, called this home for many, many years. The two circled ones are the ones we're going to cover for period five. We'll cover the others in period six. And the expansion of the U.S. leads to conflict with Native Americans. Two examples, Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, a Colorado militia attack and kill over 100 Native people. And it truly is a massacre, massacre because about two-thirds of the victims were women and children killed by the militia. And you can see that in the image right there. Another famous uh, example of this conflict takes place at the Battle of Little Bighorn there on the map in 1876. Members of the Sioux tribe, inspired by one of their leaders, Sitting Bull, kill a U.S. Army officer, General Custer, and his men in the 7th Cal Cavalry, are killed this famous event known as Custer's Last Stand. So it's a rare defeat for the Americans, but shortly after that, the American army will come in and crush native resistance in the Dakotas and in Montana. And then finally, Native Americans were expected to assimilate into white society or forced onto reservations during this time period. So you're gonna see both those things happen, unfortunately, increasingly, throughout the late part of the 19th century. And another key aspect is following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, the Californios, the Hispanic residents of the area you see, were guaranteed under the treaty property and citizenship rights. And unfortunately, very often those rights would not be respected and their land would be lost by court actions or by forced sale by the Anglo settlers coming into the Southwest. And although that did take place, there will be the preservation of Latino Hispanic culture throughout the Southwest, although the land was conquered and taken over. One last thing that's important for Key Concept 5.1 is also the U.S. interest in expanding trade led to economic, diplomatic, and cultural initiatives westward to Asia. You get the clipper ships, which allow for faster travel and a boost to U.S. trade with Asia. You have a treaty in 1844, which is the first diplomatic agreement between the U.S. and China, and its goal was to promote trade between the two nations. And as a result, many missionaries, Christian missionaries from the United States, are going to China trying to spread Christianity. And Japan as well is seen as a place for economic relationship and Japan opens up which had been isolated for over 200 years and President Fillmore sends Commodore Matthew Perry in 1852 to Japan to open up relations between the two nations. Thanks for checking out Key Concept 5.1 Explained. If you haven't done so, subscribe to Joe's Productions. Tell all the homies and homegirls out in the world to check out these videos to help them with a push. If you liked the video, click like. If you didn't like it, click like. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.